for absurd behavior and physiological digressions. As the moon waxed gibbous in the heavens, the thick sprouts of a hideous and stylized neckbeard would emerge with a vengeance. Harry flashing pinches in all directions! And she would grasp the pen and thoughtlessly render disturbing depictions of an orb-headed, angel-like humanoid creature, mostly naked with thick straps about the torso. Giant pink Flesh worm, wolf's head, round the door. Her demeanor would barely devolve at these times to the point where her guardians cared about the outcome. I take all the noises you make in the world and I eat them, spew them, regurgitate them, excrete them, bury them, shoot them off to the stars. In the aftermath of desperate discussions on the subject, a counteraction began to take form. The backlash from the pointed gossip and barely averted leers called for extreme measures. The Werelian was literally chained to the piano in a scarcely frequented den. You don't need pot to see pants! You don't need pot to see pants! Get you chained up to the piano. <laughs> At first, just for three days around the full moon, but eventually months-long bondage was the norm. Her entire range of movement was reduced to a sad eight-foot radius. She used to learn to walk, but ought to crawl. Out of utter boredom, she began to randomly hammer the resounding keys, and in time, she eke out considerable progress in the nuances of power play and the subtle science of overtone regeneration and co-creation alone. Oh. by her guardians until she discreetly nibbled the corners of her mangled sandals for surrogate sustenance <laughs> and her future clothing decomposed into a reeking pom-pom moving through stagnant air. The portraits were multiplying. Further back in the filial annals, 
back, back, back to the dawn of Era Vulgaris, emerges one Abdul Hazrad of the Fertile Crescent, who exhausted his labors on the execution of indelible marks on the surfaces of carefully smooth tablets of common stone. Parchment, papers in jars, cuneiform tablets, Get your copy of the Necronomicon here. A veritable commonplace rarity of a tome. These premeditated jottings quelled the wild impulses welling up unabated in his tender years, on which we blush to reflect. An errant slash of the left hand becomes a graceful crook in the neck of a grassland gazelle in full stride. The thoughtless blob of violet violating an unblemished uniform gray field delineates a curious puddle that draws the hapless viewer to study its slow edges. The work, of course, became very absorbing. The whole house rod harbored nagging doubts about the utility of this incessant tapping. Sniveling herd laughed at my dream writing, but I regard them with that lordly contempt which hath ever been the mark of superior parts. Trying to ignore these backward thoughts with the diligence of a deputy adolescent, another being in a being, or so it appeared to Al Hazrat. Noiseless, faceless, for frightened neighbors, budged away the interior being. The proceedings of an entire week were obliterated and replaced with a sketch of an outline that only a semi incarnate could provide. It is the old ones, adrift, asleep under the sea, they stir awake within me. A forced examination of his life's work was enacted, which brought our subject to the brink of despair and persuaded him to announce in no uncertain terms that the sum worth of his actions all told amounted to next to nothing, a lamentable loss that no amount of penance could rectify. A girl couldn't help but wonder at the inhuman audacity of the more poignant accusations of leveled at him. The gleam of these dreams is brighter than the glister of fossilized pageants. The visage of the accuser's face remained an indecipherable mass storm cloud of familiar opposition. So familiar, in fact, that the accused stood by in reverent deference until they merged. That is not dead which can eternal lie. And, and with strange, strange eons, even death may die. For the duration of this one week, al Hazrat was literally not operating in the sphere of life to which we are accustomed. <laughs> A precarious calm eventually descended on his abruptly divided being as the illusion of abduction dissipated into relatively innocuous reveries of culinary conquests and quiet preening. He eventually mummified himself should interest in the future decide to reanimate his vessel of encrusted DNA.
consumers of the great house. We are gathered here today to pour scorn on inhumanity's weakness and foibles. The oldest emotion of mankind is fear. A fear of cellars. Crypts. Caves. Underground hollows. Evacuated lecture theaters. Shadow strewn interiors. Abandoned gas houses. Bowel trouble. The gods of the winds. Minister Microbeasts, specks of the universe, artifacts of the ether. But science foils our phobias. We must excrete our fear. In a world turned upside down, we journey into the gaping yawn of silence. to you terrifying vistas of reality. Even the monsters will shit themselves. <laughs> Tonight, on Only This Night, we tell you a story of dead personalities and the immortality of the unobtainable. The new Dark Ages Theater presents Last of the Line with the strangest decline. Sometimes we start thinking about the past. <laughs> that is not dead, which can eternal lie. And with strange eons, even death may die. Have, Have a nasty, nasty night. It seemed like a damn futile business to keep on living, which would probably be a devilish bore. My great-great-grandmother, Andromeda Velveta, born XX1881 in Nagorno-Karabakh, the disputed slice of bologna between Armenian rye and Azerbaijani unleavened flatbread, to a loving rotund couple keeping a barely affordable inn. Sadly situated above a windowless butcher shop. Date of expiration unknown. It seems that around the age of 32, when most well-adjusted people have taken the sensible step of selflessly perpetuating the species, she gravitated instead to observing the celestial panorama that inexorably holds around us. Ah, telescope. In order to see things more clearly, even those lying far off. In the course of her methodical observations, a compact dime-sized meteorite of unascertained makeup barreled straight away on the length of her cheap telescope. Dead pennies! From heaven? Summarily shattering the anterior lens and without deflection punching the forehead of the head. Yuck! You have hit a nerve, sir! The meteorite perfectly trepanated the victim's left frontal lobe, where certain peripheral tissues were damaged. Evil eye. <laughs> the projectile was retrieved, but subsequently disappeared. Collapsing cosmos, dreaming of adrenaline death rush cosmology. In the following months, Velveta exhibited the classic signs of incipient motherhood. How it grows. <laughs> However, as bluntly displayed in the saga of Phineas Gage and the rogue blasting iron, which we have all come to know and love, the seemingly unassailable base temperament instilled in one as a tender hidden swath to be confounded. The maze of my minutia reveals nothing of me. Clearly, the meteorite that penetrated the length of the offending telescope was covered with the unfamiliar ooze and despicable spunk of off-gassing lesser planets and retained the chance of mingling with the unadulterated reproductive cosmos of a bona fide terrestrial. Quiet down, you brat! <laughs> Fledgling nationalist forces 
took interest in and vigorously denounced the seemingly immaculate conception. Impossible to hide the secret from the world. Dirty blood, death's blood, nationless annihilation, Aryan myth burst and perished. Throughout the duration of the scandal, she maintained that an immortal specter of unparalleled beauty participated unbidden in the completion of the contested union. A more perfect union? Puritanical sexuality beyond the magma schmegma sky womb. <laughs> this, of course, aroused the eradicatory prowess of the words waiting for moments such as these, ordered the tubes as such, of the charlatan, as it were, to be tied first taste and permanently. Alienists pretty well dispose of this love business. The extreme fertility of this ilk could not be tolerated, whatever the circumstances. After her dubious daughter disappeared into the miasmic labyrinth of state-run foster programs, Sorry, kid. Velveta spent seven months and years in abject limbo. Aloneness, differentiation, alienation, aloneness, differentiation, alienation, aloneness, aloneness. These turns of events were not lost on the authorities, and certain decrees were put into place. Send her to Bedlam! She's obnoxious to strangers! The subject would be induced to exist in a state of barrenness without knowledge of sight. Microscope, magnifier of the minuscule, even things unseen. The mental degradation that ensued from the puncture to the lobe rendered Velveta incapable of encountering her surroundings. I am a tasteless, unsophisticated yokel! With the clarity of my much less development than she previously possessed, this led to the development of the dangerous habit of removing herself from nearly any situation with undue alarm and serious perseverance. Speak like a psycho. Think like an immigrant. Speak like a psycho. Think like an immigrant. These sundry ordeals culminated in an amnesiac episode that she vacated her quarters. The trail embarked upon was cold from the start, and her lifeless was never seen or heard from her own. Serves them damn well right, I say. In short, Velveta was a twitch, boys and girls, and that's all there is to it.